but it threw a brother that you Oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty I know sometimes you feel all alone Call me anytime when you feel all the way down oh, 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 oh. Trials and temptations lie at every corner we turn It's a test from Allah to see if we بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين In the name of Allah, the compassion of the merciful, all praise is due to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his prophet Muhammad, his family and his followers all until the day of resurrection. I welcome every one of you tonight to this new episode of Meet Your Advisor here on Huda TV. And of course, as we start with a topic, tonight's topic is timely and it's regarding the lunar eclipse that just happened two days ago as you know the lunar eclipse took place on the night of wednesday this is in the uh, our area in saudi arabia the gulf the middle east and these areas where there was a complete and full eclipse of the moon now some people would just be wondering this is a natural phenomenon, something that would take place from time to time. And it's very interesting. People would look at it and enjoy how the uh, light goes out uh, partially, uh, little by little, until there was a full and complete uh, disappearance of the moon and then reappearance of the moon in degrees until the whole full moon comes back again. Now, we know that uh, the lunar eclipse would take place only in the middle of the month, like on the 13th, the 14th, or the 15th uh, night of the month. This is because uh, when the moon is so full and then the earth would come in between the sun and the moon and it would uh, block the view completely. Now, people would be wondering, what is the significance of this? We know that this is a change of the natural happening because normally we are supposed to get, according to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're supposed to get the light of the moon fully every month and every night, especially during the bright nights, the nights of the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. Now, if this is disrupted and is not going according to the norm, then there must be something uh, different. There must be something um, of irregularity, if you will. But that is Allah's decision, subhanahu wa ta'ala. From time to time, this may happen. And the same thing happens to, to the sun, where there is a sun eclipse. And some, sometimes there is a full uh, darkness uh, where there is no light of the sun. Uh, most of the time, it is partial, partial uh, uh, disappearance of the light of the sun. Now, this is something that we should look at, not only from uh, th the natural phenomena, it's something that is happening in our part of the world, but then there is a reason for it, which is very, very related to what Islam addresses in this uh, for the, uh, regarding this particular issue. Now, we know that um, it is possible to calculate and to know uh, the eclipses ahead of time, years from years uh, from now, uh, it, you know, for, for years to come. But then, this does not change the fact that it is something that is going um, against the natural things, against what we uh, know, although this is done by Allah's decision and Allah's wisdom and Allah's ability. May glory be to him. The question is, how did the Prophet ﷺ behave regarding this particular issue? Well, what happened when the sun eclipsed during his time in the 10th year of uh, uh, the 10th year of Hijrah, 
what happened is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam uh, hurried and was was really um, so much affected and moved by this that he uh, when he knew that uh, there was a uh, some a partial disappearance of the light of the sun he hurried into the masjid and he asked someone to say as salatu jami'a prayer is in session uh, uh, so people would come to the masjid and people started to come and pour into the masjid of the prophet peace be upon him he prayed uh, the kusuf prayer which is different than the normal prayer because what he did is he started reading al-fatiha just like we we do in every prayer loudly and he then read a long surah almost like uh, the length of surah al-baqarah which is really really long almost like two and a half parts of the glorious quran then he made ruku' a long one almost close to the to the standing then he stood up and said sami allahu liman hamida rabbana wa lakal hamd then he started again reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, then um, another long surah, but shorter, shorter than the, uh, the first one. Then he made ruku' again a long ruku' but shorter than the first one. And he stood up for a very, very long time, almost closer to the ruku' time. Then he made sujood almost close to the standing up of uh, time and then sitting in between the two sajdas and again making another sajda uh, almost closer in time and duration to that. And then he stood up for the second rakah and he made the same thing like two rukus in one rakah. And then the second thing happened, but again, less in time, shorter than the first one. Then he made taslim. But afterwards, he stood up and advised the companions regarding this particular phenomenon and said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so jealous of the things that are committed against him. And he, especially he mentioned zina or adultery and fornication because this is a grave crime and uh, transgression against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is how, how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with this matter, which is so um, effect, affecting and, and moving since the Prophet ﷺ uh, did uh, actually address this particular issue. And he indeed showed us how we can pray this particular prayer in a different fashion, again, under s- different circumstances, normally under fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment because this is uh, uh, changing uh, the way things are working for both the sun and the light. Now, if, uh, the sun and the moon. If we think about the sun and the moon and how they are uh, giving us the light, they are so huge in size that they are actually of great benefit to us Now, they are calculated to be positioned in some distance from us, not so close to us, because if the sun, for example, now we know that the the moon is, uh, is reflecting the light that is coming from the sun. Now, the sun itself, when coming closer to us, if it comes shorter degrees, a small, small, uh, uh, you know, uh, distance uh, to us, it would burn the whole earth and maybe some other uh, orbits and, and uh, things in the, in the um, uh, solar system. But then if it gets even a little further than this calculated distance, then we would be freezing. Now, this is Allah's decision, subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he made this whole universe in such great fashion with great calculation. Now, if any uh, disruption of this would, would take place, that sh- would create this fear in the hearts of the believers that they know um, because this is a reminder of how things will take place on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran uh, regarding this uh, as, as uh, we would be 
uh, as you can see in Surah Al-Qiyamah, uh, the uh, Day of Judgment, where uh, things would, would take place. Uh, how, how the eclipse would take place and then the light of the moon would go away and then the whole, uh, the sun and the moon would both be wrapped up and then there is no light anymore. There, there is a whole uh, destruction of a disruption of this system that has taken place since the beginning of, the, of life on, on earth. Now things on the Day of Judgment will be different. That's why this is a reminder. If that light goes and comes back, it shows the power uh, and might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how by his own decision affects this and, and how he can disrupt this system and brings it back again. That's why people, Muslims and believers would rush into prayer and you'd uh, continue praying until this, hin th this whole thing uh, uh, is over. Now, according to the scholars of Islam, the duration of that prayer uh, would last even up to four hours. Now, I know it would be difficult for people to stand because in, in the report, on the, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ did this, some of the companions fell out of consciousness because it was long. It was long for many of them and that's why some of them could not bear standing all that long and doing that prayer for that long. But the Prophet ﷺ, when, when reciting the glorious Qur'an, when standing in the prayer, saw everything in his own prayer. It, even he extended a hand, extended his hand to take from the grapes of, of uh, heaven because he, th he saw uh, paradise in front of him and he wanted to eat from the grapes that was available there. And he even saw hellfire, which, you know, he, he, he you know, retreated uh, back just from, from fearing that he might get some uh, heat from hellfire. This was special to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Not everyone who is involved in this sort of prayer would see something like that. But then it was given to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so he would tell the companions what took place. Now that is something Muslims in particular need to worry and to care about. They know that this thing is not just only for the joy of it because there are so many benefits, there are some, so many good things that we, we take and we get from the sun and the moon. And if there is any disruption of their uh, system and how they are run because they are, they are just run, running to their own distance. And that would, in fact, be a cause for us to be closer to Allah, to repent, to think about, to have some reflection and think about what we are doing in our life so that we can come back to Allah and ask Him forgiveness. And that's why it was encouraged, and as the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the companions to uh, give sadaqah, to pray, to make dua, to make istighfar, asking forgiveness of Allah the Almighty. Have some fear in your heart of Him. May glory be to Him. Because this whole system might go into, into ruin. Uh, you know, there is a fear that this might be the beginning of the Day of Judgment when, when things would change. That How the Prophet, peace be upon him, learned about that. How, that's how he taught the companions to be so conscious of these issues and not to take them because some, you know, people normally in the media would just take this as, as, as fun and they would say, well, when there is a solar uh, eclipse, you need just to be careful not to directly look into the sun because that might, you know, hurt your, your eyes, might bring some damage to your vision, might even uh, create blindness. That is, uh, of course, uh, something we need to take care of. But this is not the end of this. There is a whole disruption of that because there is so much concentration of light as we can see. But still, still no one would look into the sun directly, but especially during eclipse because it would hurt your own eyes and it might affect your vision. But then, of course, with cameras, people look through the cameras and through some 
uh, lenses and so on, but they just only take it for fun. They think it's, it's just only something that we would enjoy and look at this uh, that comes only between, you know, like a few years and then because during the time of the Prophet wasallam, eclipse took place only one time, one time in the 10th year of Hijrah, but not after that. But this, look at this year. So far, we had one eclipse in the month of Muharram, in the beginning of this Hijrah year, and we had one two days ago, we had another uh, lunar eclipse, and we might, according to calculations, inshallah, by the, by the will of Allah, we would have another solar eclipse on the 29th of this month of Rajab. Then we would have towards the end, on the 29th of the Hijjah, another solar eclipse. Now, getting these eclipses one after the other is a sign that we need to be careful. And these are warnings of Allah. These are signs to remind us to come closer to Allah, to repent, to be fearful, to prepare for the hereafter. This is what a Muslim is supposed to do, to be so conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be very close to Him, not to take things lightly, or only just like the non-believers, those who believe only in things that they see, because there's always something beyond what we see, something that we need to ponder and think about, and of course, learn from, come back to Allah, so that we can be good Muslims, better human beings to deal with issues that we have. If we are unjust, we need to stop this. As we can see, there's so much aggression, there's so much oppression, there are, there are so many uh, wrong things that people are doing and committing against Allah's laws, against um, being kind and merciful and being just towards others. Obviously, we need to correct these things. We need to go back to the principles of how a good and uh, just life need to be done and lived in this world so that we can enjoy in this life and of course enjoy the outcome and the bliss and reward on the Day of Judgment. I wanted to uh, start with that and of course as we always do, we uh, come back and, and try to, uh, to remind ourselves as this is my topic and as I said, as I take this from my uh, Friday sermon, I would, I would pass it on to you so that we can learn about this. And of course, at the end of today's sermon, I called upon uh, our university, for example, to uh, uh, hold a, um, a, a seminar on this topic, uh, scholarly seminar discussing these issues, the benefits and the harms um, uh, of, of this disruption of this uh, solar and uh, lunar uh, system. And then, of course, afterwards, we, we need to see how we are supposed to conduct ourselves doing that and make the um, uh, society aware of that. Now, I'm glad that some Muslim media, alhamdulillah, particularly here in Saudi Arabia, reflected this event and covered it very, very great uh, with, with, with so, so much, alhamdulillah, uh, good coverage reminding people of these things that we just mentioned tonight. All right. N now, um, the first question or this email is coming from uh, Aisha who said, is dyeing the eye brows permissible? Well, that's a subject of discussion among the scholars. Some are saying, yes, if you can, uh, you know, dye your eyebrows with something that might be just to, to look different, but don't, don't make it like thinner than they are because that might have some deception there. But to, to have a different color is permissible, just like, uh, according to some scholars, just like dyeing uh, a man's beard or dyeing uh, a woman's uh, hair of the head or man's uh, hair of the head. You know, all this is permissible according to some scholars. Some are saying it is not, they're not permissible. So you still have that, um, you know, difference of opinion. And uh, as if, if you feel like this is going to make you 
look nicer, especially for someone who's married and wants to look uh, nicer, younger in the eyes of her husband. Alhamdulillah, that would be that would be nice. But of course, not for a woman to look, uh, you know, uh, to 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 show this in public, because that's not supposed to be the case. All right. Now this is uh, Sabah who says I have a question: Is it a sunnah to perform wudu before we sleep? But as we uh, uh, sleep in the bed. Uh, our wudu might be in, invalid by passing a wind, etc. So, uh, should we get up and do it again, or what? Well, actually, when you go to bed, you you know that your wudu will be invalid. However, before you go into sleep, the sunnah is to have wudu, because always when you sleep with this wudu, that means alhamdulillah you're ready. You have that sense of purity. You have this physically and mentally, and you are ready to wake up for the, for the next prayer, especially for Fajr prayer, where a lot of people don't wake up for Fajr, and we know many people, subhanAllah, you know, miss the prayer of Fajr almost like every day, and they just, especially these days in, in the summertime where Fajr comes, in, comes so early, I know, in, in Riyadh, for example, it comes at about uh, 3.30, uh, 3.33 to be exact, these days. And that is really uh, too early, and, and many masjids uh, do pray before 4 o'clock. And, and some people just don't wake up until, like, it is time for, for work at 6 or 6.30 or 7 or even beyond that. And, of course, if we do it on purpose, that is that is prohibited and it's, it's a, a, a grave and terrible mistake that people are involved in. Um, so uh, the sunnah is, is to have wudu and even if you, if you break it and have to wake up and, and go, alhamdulillah you had that intention uh, that you want to sleep with wudu on and uh, of course Allah would reward you for keeping and preserving that sunnah. All right, this is... Um, a question from Shamim who said, uh, can you put some light on the celebrations of Sha'ban the 15th, which is uh, uh, mostly followed in India or probably the sub-Indian continent? Well, thank you, Shamim, for raising the question. Now, the idea behind this is that some people, some people think that the 15th of Sha'ban is the time of uh, Layla, Layla al-Mubarakah, or the blessed night where the Qur'an was revealed. That's what they thought. But uh, obviously, this is not the case, because Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةٍ مُبَارَكَةٍ إِنَّا كُنَّا مُنذِرِينَ فِيهَا يُفْرَقُ كُلُّ أَمْرٍ حَكِيمٍ أَمْرًا مِنْ عِنْدِنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا مُرْسِلِينَ uh, This is... This is the, the this best night where the Quran was revealed is obviously is in Laylatul Qadr. And we know Laylatul Qadr is in the month of Ramadan, definitely, without any any doubt, because Allah says in the glorious Quran, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Verily we revealed it, meaning the glorious Quran, in the night of Qadr or honor. Now um, that negates the fact that these people do celebrate the fifteenth of of Sha'ban, and it became just like a habit and uh, a tradition that people kept um, in in many countries, which is which is not valid. There is no support for that in both the glorious Quran nor the Sunnah or the practice of the uh, companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the first three hundred years of Islam. It only came later on when people tried and and, and started to invent and add things. To the uh, to the religion, so there is no support for having the fifteenth of the Sha- of, of Shaban as a celebration. There is no true and authentic hadith in that regard. In fact, all of the hadith regarding that night are not valid, are not strong, are not accepted by the scholars. And many scholars talked about this in their own fatwas, in their own books, um, and and like Ibn Rajab Al Hambali and. Um, many, many others who address this particular issue and said there is no uh, valid support whatsoever 
for, for that. All right. And Khalid, this is Khalid, um, who's a young man, I said, uh, he, yeah, he's asking about me personally, and I, um, I can answer you by email, inshallah, Khalid. But regarding uh, some of the questions here, he said, is it sin when I talk while walking to the masjid um, and the imam is giving the sermon for Jum'ah prayer? Well, why, Khalid, would you go in late into, into the Friday prayer? You know, you should, as a son, alhamdulillah, go as early as possible. We know that from the time of sunrise or uh, fajr time, the dawn, until the dhuhr time or the time for the start of Jum'ah prayer, uh, there are like five hours, five exact hours. Now, the earlier you, you go, the better and the higher the reward will be. مَنْ جَاءَ فِي السَّاعَةِ الْأُولَى فَكَأَنَّمَا قَدَّمَ بَدَنَا وَمَنْ جَاءَ فِي السَّاعَةِ الثَّانِيَ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَدَّمَ بَقَرَةً and so on. So if you come in the first um, uh, hour, it is like you have uh, given a, a, a she-camel. If you uh, come in the second hour, it's just like you have given a sadaqa, um, a cow. And then in the third hour, as you have done like uh, a sheep. And then in, in the fourth hour, um, like you, you've given uh, a chicken. And in the fifth hour, it's just like you have given uh, an egg. And then if you, um, and the, the angels will be standing at the doors of the masjid, writing whoever comes in uh, inside the masjid. And then when the imam comes uh, and starts a khutbah, they will just fold their own uh, records and they just sit and listen to the khutbah. So there, anyone coming afterwards will not have any any of these three words. So that is what we need to, to have is, is coming as early as possible. But of course, if you s talk about something that you, you're talking to, a, to your friend, it would be all right. I mean, if it happens that just only one time you're doing it, uh, but not on a regular basis. I still have some more questions from you, Khalid. I'll answer this after this break. So please stay with us. I heard it through a brother that you Oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty oh, 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 oh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose whom he wills subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy for his messengership for the revelation to be revealed this is not for the human beings to make that decision, if a person would turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely, truthfully, asking for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to forgive. We have as Muslims a duty, and that is to recite the book of Allah, to ponder over the verses, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to act according to the Quran. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses everything, but it who would this mercy will be for? And the Prophet ﷺ was sent to all mankind. So the Ummah or the people of the Prophet ﷺ are all mankind since the time of the Prophet ﷺ till the Day of Judgment. Why waste our life without getting to know every verse in the Quran, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? to enjoy their time? Do you want them to benefit from their time? Would you like to increase their knowledge in Islam and general culture? Honesty, Brother Frisco. Yes! Whoa! How should you choose your friend? And they should have lots and lots of toys! Yes! A show consists of challenges, questions, oh, no, no, no. the two teams, with the most points at the end of the show, they win the lovely golden medal. Or, if you come in second place, of course, you win a lovely silver medal. The winning team overall gets a lovely golden medal. I'm very excited I did it. I didn't believe that I could do it. Do you like to teach them the Islamic values? Would you like to get to know our puppet Frisco? It's a good day today. Join our program, Kids Quiz, to have more knowledge and fun. <laughs> 
I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Now, regarding this question from Khalid, um, there is another question. He says, uh, what is your, um, or what about shaving the beard? Well, I don't know. Khalid, if you're young enough or old enough to get to get a beard, but as you know, it is not permissible for a Muslim to shave his beard because keeping the beard is the Prophet's uh, way, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And of course, there are many ahadith, I think up to five ahadith, where there is always an encouragement and emphasis on keeping the beard and not to shave it or take anything from it. So that is the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And of course, we need uh, to keep it. That's, that's a sign of manhood, actually. And it's uh, like, look at the, the Jews, for example, keep their beards. Some Christians do keep, keep their beards. So we know that that's part of their own um, encouragements and, and, and religion. So what about Muslims? Uh, obviously, we do have the support from the Sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Also, um, what about uh, singing? Well, what kind of singing are you doing? Are you doing it with instruments or just only by your own voice? If you're doing any singing with your own voice, um, fine, alhamdulillah, if, if that is going to make you happy and there is nothing wrong with the words uh, that you are saying, um, you know, it would be, it would be fine and, and uh, uh, permissible. However, if we are uh, saying something bad, even, even without singing, it's, it's prohibited. But using instruments, all of the musical instruments are prohibited except what we call a deaf. Now, deaf is like a, a sort of a, a, a drum, but it's not a complete closed drum. Uh, it's only from one side. Uh, whether it's, it's, it's only has, it has only this uh, skin leather on one side, but then the other side is open. So it is really uh, something that we could use, and particularly women could use, especially on happy occasions, um, when there is someone who's uh, coming from a travel, or if there is like a, a, a homecoming, or if there is marriage, and, and any... Um, happy occasion celebration obviously it is permissible for for women but of course there should need, should should not be any mixing between men and women in this regard but then uh, again using any instruments like uh, singers today who uh, obviously go into all these uh, singings and, and talking about love and you know all the hardships they go through as they uh, suffer because of the person they they love who's turning away from them and so on and so forth all of this is not is not the right thing to do and to say well i think the last question from khalid is how can we improve our islamic knowledge that's a good question and what we need to know is to go directly to the sources take it from the horse's mouth as they say go to the glorious quran read the tafsirs of the uh, glorious Quran, of, of course the authentic tafsir, and go to the sunnah again with the interpretation, learn the principles of faith or the matters of aqidah, which will make you a strong Muslim in your belief system. And then, of course, you can expand the knowledge beyond that into different areas where there is always Islam. And, and some people would find it more enjoyable for them to read, for example, in tafsir, to read in hadith, to read in, in general Islamic knowledge. Some are very much interested in fiqh, in knowing the rulings regarding uh, different issues. All of this is good, but of course, the basics uh, of Islamic knowledge come from the glorious Quran and the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. So I encourage you, for example, to read um, the tafsir by 
uh, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, that's one of the best tafsirs that we have, and it's handy and, and, and easy to read. Uh, that's, I would assume that you're doing it in Arabic, um, but even if you, uh, Ibn Kathir now is available in English, and you can still consult uh, the English translation for that, for anyone who's interested. And also, read, for example, the collection by uh, uh, very great book, Subul al-Salam. Uh, that's one good uh, collection of hadith based on the fiqhi classification of, uh, of topics and subjects. I think that's, that's something that we, we could always look into, and that would be of great benefit to every Muslim, inshallah. Well, thank you, Khalid, for all your questions. Now, this is from a desperate wife who said, I've been married for five years now. However, my husband refuses to get a job or start a business to support us. So far, I have supported all expenses, including his family needs on occasion. Moreover, I have tried uh, discussing with him nicely in anger, in tears, and depression, but he does not move. He thinks it is okay to do so. Is there a hadith that I can uh, uh, present to him? Or what can we do or can I do that will make him realize his responsibilities? Well, I feel very sad, really, regarding a man who is supposed to go and work. I assume this man is having enough strength to go and work. And he has... Uh, the ability to work, to do some business, but he's not doing it. He is used to eating, sleeping, and doing everything that he likes without any, um, anything that he, he needs to do. And let me say this. I, it, I know it might be frustrating for your sister, but actually you are part of the problem by giving him, by supporting him and supporting his family. What I would assume... Uh, or I would advise you to do, is stop. Stop spending on him in particular. Stop spending on his family. Let him suffer and, and know that there's nothing that comes free. It is not your responsibility. It is his responsibility because um, you are the wife. He is the husband. This is what he needs to do. All of the hadith, all the way the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, did encourage. In fact, there are so many hadith uh, that really address these issues. And you can go back to uh, the books of fiqh uh, on the uh, marriage and talking about expenditure in particular. And you'd find so many hadith, in fact, so many verses in this regard, encouraging a man to support his family. Uh, where the Prophet ﷺ says, for example, any uh, dinar that you spend on your family is, is rewardable. Uh, even the uh, bite that you put in the mouth of your wife is rewardable. So everything, um, in, in fact, and all of, this has been the tradition, this is, we know this in, in all of the cultures, pre-Islamic cultures, Islamic cultures, and then the cultures that um, are found in the whole world, it is normally the responsibility of the man to go out and work and earn and the wife to stay at home and to prepare for the family and to, you know, we can uh, take these different roles so that life can flourish and life can go along very well. But if it's the reverse, where I know in, in some areas, Women work hard and men stay home. I mean, this is, this is the exception. Uh, this is in part of North Africa. Um, there's a culture called Tawariq. We know that this is something that they did, but this is against everything that we know of from the religion and from the uh, culture and from the practice of many societies throughout history until today. And I think everyone enjoys, even in Europe, they still enjoy the traditional way of the family where the man goes out, earns his living, brings everything home, and he would find the wife preparing the meals uh, or the meal for, for the whole family. They would enjoy sitting together. Everyone is, is doing his share in this nice living. But if this man is not willing 
to, to, to know this and to learn it, stop spending on him and you'll see. Of course, he might get angry, he might, you know, threaten, he might, you know, uh, express this in, in, in terrible words or something like that, but still, you have the right to stop this and to show him that he needs to work. And I think if we uh, push him towards that way, he will, he will probably take that route afterwards, but he's, he's been... As you said, five years. I don't know how long has he been, um, you know, workless or jobless. Uh, that's that's really something terrible to hear about a man who's not supposed to uh, to do that. This is uh, an email from Rowan who says, um, "My father died almost three years now, and then my mother is now 61 years old. I want her to perform Hajj this year." Can she perform Hajj without a mahram? Well, if she doesn't have a mahram and you know that she's getting old and she wants to enjoy, uh, of course, going to this and perform this, although it's not um, uh, a duty on her, it is not an obligation on her to do that because she doesn't have a mahram. If there's a mahram uh, who's available, it would always be better because he can take care of her. I know, let me tell you from my own experience, where we had some group who came from uh, the USA and we, we took care of their own, um, you know, hajj and they were just living, uh, mashallah, and, and the government hosted them. They enjoyed their uh, the hospitality and everything. But then one of them had her leg broken. Now, she did not have a, a mahram and it was terrible who would take care of her? She became a burden upon everyone around. Um, and who would even go ahead and take care of her, carries her into the wheelchair, takes her into uh, you know, the haram and, and have her uh, make the tawaf, or go to Arafah and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are so many things that uh, we always need someone, a mahram, to be around a woman to take care of her to. Um, uh, even ha have the companionship. But if you uh, have no one around, it would be so difficult. Yet, according to some scholars for this particular age, if she uh, would have someone uh, like a, a group of women whom she can travel with, who have their own places to stay and who are with each other, who can support this woman and they are willing to do it, um, you know, although she might need some help from time to time, even physical help, then if that is the case and they are, um, there is some safety and, and, and she would uh, feel safe and comfortable by doing this, according to some scholars, it would be permissible, especially at this age, especially at this age, and that's what we always need to uh, consider and take. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide for her. This is a very long email which you know I could not really get so I'd like uh, my um, sister Aisha who wrote me this long email to please try to um, you know summarize because it's, it's a long long issue and I'd, I'd rather have it summarized because you know I, I, uh, I got lost almost lost in the uh, in the long email here so forgive me for that and I would always encourage you kindly to explain what the issue is but then towards the end you know show me exactly what you want so I can uh, respond directly to your question so if you could kind, kindly give me the substance the, you know what exactly you want me to do uh, towards the end of the email um, this is Iqbal who says I um, okay I'm, I'm from California and I uh, pray to Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala for Huda TV and, and myself and he said um, he's, he's asking if he can find some work he's in the medical business and if he can find some work here in Saudi Arabia and of course um, you can always consult directly these places in Saudi Arabia uh, in Mecca, in Medina, in Riyadh and Damam and so many other areas of course it is always possible to consult them directly by, by phone, by email, 
by mail if you if you'd like you can uh, always ask they they from time to, to time they do um, uh, announce jobs you can consult the Saudi embassy in Washington or the Saudi consulate if you're in California there is a, a, a consulate a Saudi consulate in Los Angeles you can consult these and uh, hopefully Allah may Allah give you all that I would uh, I would still even uh, I know some some friends who work in uh, some uh, hospitals who might if they are in need of people like you may Allah make it easy for you all right this is from uh, Raziyat who said um, okay uh, now when I have received your email I've become afraid to write maybe someone well it's just regarding the email um, because I know that some people would not like to write to huda.tv and of course all of the emails that you write to huda.tv would come directly to me and no one looks at these emails so they are secure they are uh, private and and personally uh, I only see them myself no one else according to my knowledge but you still can can uh, write to me at meet your advisor at gmail meet your advisor which is with an OR at the end, meet your advisor at gmail.com. Now, I know the policy of the station here is you have always to, to go through the email that was set up for the program, for every program, you know, by Huda TV. But still, uh, you can have this meet your advisor, as you can see, or you can just change the OR at the end at gmail.com, and inshallah, it will reach me. Um, without any problem by the grace of Allah so uh, no matter what you have uh, feel um, you know secure that we have everything inshallah um, uh, uh, you know with, without any problem this is um, what is this all right um, let me see this is where is it okay it says, how are you? I'm very uh, much interested in watching this. Alhamdulillah. I have a question about zakah. Up until now, I'm giving zakah on every year during the month of Ramadan according to the um, Sharia law. I want to know that is there a separate zakah for my monthly salary if I'm receiving a high salary um, like 3,000 US dollars in addition to the yearly calculation of all incomes. Also, for gold every year, do I have to give zakah? Uh, I am giving every year, but some people say once, um, if I give for the gold, this would be enough. Well, this is from Sri Lanka, Dr. Muhammad Nawras. Well, thank you, may Allah give you all the blessings uh, of this. But let me let me say this, th- let me give this, uh, you know, very interesting what you're saying here. Um, first, it's not the Sharia law to pay the zakah in, in Ramadan. It is, uh, some people choose Ramadan because it's, uh, uh, you know, a blessed month and it's good uh, and people expect, especially the poor people towards the end of Ramadan, they expect some uh, gifts uh, and, and some income increase so they can buy for the, for the Eid and enjoy with the rest of the Muslims. Fine. But, you know, Actually, what you need to do is your monthly income. You have to calculate everything, everything, whether this is uh, the original salary or any extra uh, additional thing, and calculate all of this. And after the passage of one full Hijra year, you give the zakah 2.5%. That's 1 out of 40 for everything, everything. But if you choose to do it ahead of time, even during the month of Ramadan, that would be fine. Still, you can do it ahead of time, before the year is, is over, and just make it um, on the day, the day of, of the year. For example, if I choose the 20th of Ramadan, that would be the, the day when I give zakah for everything that I have at hand. I go and calculate all what I have, and I give the zakah for that, and that would do the job for me, for everything. All right. Um, then, we, we are talking about gold. 
do, do you have to pay the gold uh, well? Uh, actually, actually, uh, for, for you, you have to pay the gold because you don't wear gold as, as a man. But if this is for your wife, um, there is a difference uh, among the scholars regarding this particular point. If the gold is within normal and there is uh, no, um, you know, it's not really much, then the majority of scholars are saying, uh, all right, let me take this phone call before I go at the end. Yes, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Go ahead, please. Yeah, my question. Yes. Regarding uh, Ahlul Fitra. Uh -huh. In Quran, it's Ahlul Fitra. Who are the people of Ahlul Fitra? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, what is what is the definition of Ahlul Fitra? Yes. Well, it's yes. there is no nothing, nothing called Ahlul Fitra. There as such, but we talk about Islam as the religion of Fitra. Yes, but not Ahlul Fitra. Or um, normally people talk about this on a different. This is for Zakah, for example. They call it Fitra at times during the month of Ramadan. But that's. Okay. okay. Thank you so okay, much. Thank you. Explain this to me, please. Write me an email regarding this particular point so I can make it. There is, as far as I know, there is nothing called Ahlul Fitra. Uh, but then uh, if all of us are, you know, born with Fitra and all. But let me, let me say that um, if you have uh, gold, uh, within the normal, then there is the majority of scholars are saying there is no zakah. However, some scholars are encourage you, encouraging you to pay 2.5% for the value of the gold during the time when you give the zakah. So that is basically what I'm um, advising you. Thank you so much, Muhammad. Thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. And of course, we will receive your emails, answer them, inshallah, in the next episode. Until then, I leave you with Allah's care and protection. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. I know sometimes you feel all alone. Call me anytime when you feel all the way down. Oh, 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 oh. Trials and temptations lie at every corner we turn. It's a test from Allah to see if we succeed or not. My brother, it's a trial that you're going through. So don't be afraid. Allah's there for you. So hold on, Allah's there for you, hold on, He's listening to you, hold on.